So, hello culture fans. Welcome back to episode 18 of the Culture Books podcast. We are doing Use of Weapons. Sorry, episode 18 of season 3. Um, just to make sure we don't lose our other good work in the past. Um, and yes, we are the Culture Books podcast. We're doing Use of Weapons, the book. Um, we are doing chapter 9, N-I-N-E. Uh, it, of course, if you've come this far, you understand completely about the weird and frustrating, but still wonderful, um, and, uh, enlivening chapter structure. My name is John and I'm joined by Sheridan. Hello, Sheridan. How to, are you today? I'm good. And to, you wanted to say something. To be fair, the, um, number structure is only really annoying if you're trying to do an episode title for a podcast <laughs> uh, if you're keeping track of the chapters it's still weird and i mean when i first few times i read the book i didn't actually pay any attention to the chapter structures i just thought it had a narrative that jumped around we know on the kindle version mm. they don't separate the second no they they, they, they haven't coped at all with what's being thrown down by this book yeah. um which is sad neither on the audible um mm. version either but that makes sense yeah Okay. All right. Well, it's good we did that. So, Sheridan, um, what do we do at this point in the story? You have 30 seconds to recap the book thus far. Okay. You're going to count me in? Three, two, one, go. Okay. So, the culture is a, inter not intergalactic, a gal actually, they are intergalactic. Sorry. Oh, geez. I'm going horribly <laughs> wrong. Um, anyway, huge civilization um, that keeps uh, humans as pets with super intelligent minds. We're finding out what they're up to in this sector of the galaxy. Sheridan, do not touch your mic stand. <laughs> Um, okay, and um, so um, and Sheridan Zakawi's dark past has been explored, but in this chapter we're going forward in time to find out what Sheridan Zakawi is doing next. That was that was um, a recap, more like my kind of recap. Well, it didn't help that you started fiddling with your mic stand after we started recording. But... You know, a little bit of a sort of sensory moment, just touching things. Twiddling the knobs. Yeah, yeah. a bit Make, of a fiddle. Making horrible grunching sounds. To, <laughs> luckily, we're recording in two tracks, so I can cut out your grunching sounds. Um, okay, so Sheridan, what, what do you do now? Now I recap the chapter in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, and this is a pig of a chapter to recap. Oh, you reckon? It has multiple acts. True. <laughs> it's quite unusual in this book in this chapter has sometimes multiple I think acts. the more complex ones are easier to summarize because you can just cut stuff out this chapter is also the inspiration for one of the many covers this book has had one of the oldest oh. ones uh, where the, some sort of aircraft is being shot out over a canyon um, and we will discuss who is shooting at it as we um, go on but um, okay so Sheridan your time starts in Three, two, one. So Calway goes for a walk and gets hit by a snowball by some kids, but then things look up because he finds out Beche wants to meet him and he goes to meet him. He goes through a big, long underground tunnel and then um, Beche decides he wants to see the surface because clearly he's been down there for too long and a big fight ensues and Beche, uh, Zakawi escapes with, well, he's about to escape with Beche. Okay, and you got there with six seconds to spare. Jerry, that was good. Uh, yeah, no, there was nothing to uh, nitpick about. Um, or you know, I mean, there's always a question of priorities, but we'll um, we've got the whole episode to discuss the uh, full detail of the chapter. What did you think of this chapter? It was good. I mean, there was a lot in it. Okay. Lots of characters. A lot of characters introduced and then disappeared. Yeah. And um, now I've um, actually done a lot of trying to get AI to um, generate the cover image for this episode. And I did actually do a collage of all of them. But I've gone back because there is one that um, told there was action above a flower market has made the capsule, the little spaceship, look like a flower. Oh, it, cool. once, once it knew that there were flowers in the equation, it was making everything look <laughs> like flowers. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, the... I actually think the la the uh, generative AI is making much worse images now than it was a year ago. Yeah, right. That's that's anecdotal, but I've heard a lot of other people making similar complaints, and I've definitely seen it in my in my own things. It's been overwhelmed uh, with information. Uh, it could just be they're dialing down the um, fidelity because there's so many losers like me uh, trying to get um, cheapo art out of it. It's got ADHD and can't cope with the information overload oh, that uses is the a lot modern of condition. <laughs> they, use a lot, they use a lot of power, a scary amount of power. Mind you, so does a simple Google search. I think you can um, boil a cup of tea for the um, power that Google uses to that is the rumor. do a simple search. Mm. 
Although they do tend to um, put their data centers next to hydro plants. So at least it's moderately green. Mm. Okay. All right. So um, is the car we goes for a walk? What's up with that? Yeah, it was kind of an interesting little addition, but it has a really good line about, um, you know, when you have your cold breath and it says, yeah. it said his breath went before him. I really okay. like, I really like that description living in a cold climate. Now, there is also a line about old men straightening their backs, which gets repeated later in the chapter. And I think that's a little oh, bit of why yeah, it's yeah, here, it's but we'll we'll get to that. So, um, he goes for his walk. Uh, he's got his raincoat back. Now, even though I've read this book multiple times, I am struggling at this point to wonder why this old raincoat is getting so much... Um... Oh, well, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't honestly recall, um, and I'm sure we've got people who'll in the comments uh, remind me, but if we when we come to it later in the book, we might, um, you know, revisit, hey, there's the raincoat, but that's something to look forward to. Or maybe maybe it's just a thing that we'll never know the answer to. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, if you're going to cosplay as a cowboy, the raincoat would be a big part of it, and then I thought, I am long, long, long past cosplaying as a cowboy. I might be able to get away with Baychai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm just going to read a bit about the slipping over, though. When he did slip, it was in front of some young people. He was walking carefully down some icy steps leading into a broad suspension bridge over a railway junction. The youngsters were walking towards him, laughing and joking with each other. He divided his attention between the treacherous steps and the group. They looked very young, and their actions, gestures, and peeling voices all seemed to bubble with energy, suddenly making him feel his age. There were four of them. The two young men trying to impress the girls, talking loudly. One of the girls, in particular, was tall and dark and elegant in that unselfconscious manner of the recently matured. He kept his eyes on her, straightening his back, and just before his feet went out from under him, felt a slight swagger return to his walk. Go on, you want to say something? <laughs> I was just going to say, um, having returned to university to do a master's degree when I was nearly 40... There is so quite something quite terrifying about being around young people and especially in a position of vulnerability, which is what happens to him when he slips. Yeah, uh, and it's, I mean, I'm going to read a bit more of it because there's, there's a few interesting things in there. And there is this way that horrible old people get really angry just at the fact young people are existing. Yeah. Um, and, and he's kind of coming on a bit of this here. Uh, he crashed down on the last step and sat for a moment, then smiled thinly and got up just before the four young people drew level with him. One of the young men was guffawing, making a show of covering his muffled mouth with a gloved hand. He brushed some snow from the tails of the raincoat and flicked some of it at the young man. They went by and on up the stairs laughing. He walked halfway across the bridge, grimacing at the pain seeping up from his backside, and heard a voice call, he turned around and took a snowball full in the face. Um, it's one of those... It, it's really well done, actually, considering Banks was quite a young man when he wrote this. Um, you know, here you've got this um, galactic Napoleon um, totally capable of murdering these yeah. kids um, in a heartbeat. Um, and they, they've got no idea the peril they're in. And uh, just... <laughs> I mean, he's the rude in the first place. He's the one flicking the snow off his coat at the at, at them. And uh, this young guy being just like, okay, mate, snowball in the face. <laughs> Um, yeah. Any other bits you took from that? You notice, um, we did get the, um, the swagger and trying to stiffen his back to him. He was trying to impress mm. the girl, wasn't he? I think he was just trying to... Not look old? Yeah. Mm. But he was deaf. I mean, the description of the recently matured, um, girl, I mean, that's, um... I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very specific description of a throwaway character. It's also definitely written by a man, because, um... <laughs> Recently matured girls aren't known for being unself-conscious. Yeah, it's more how we perceive them, I guess. Yes. They're, they're desperately self-conscious, but we, yeah. um, we we just project what we want to see, really. Um, yep, yeah. okay. Um, and there's a little bit more a bit further down. Once he knew he would have been embarrassed at what had happened, embarrassed at slipping, at being seen to slip, at being hit by the snowball after so gullibly turning around on cue and at the elderly couple witnessing his embarrassment. Once, he might have chased after the youngsters, to give them a fright at least, but not now. Now, 
anytime you go chasing after anyone on the street to at least give them a fright, there's a very high chance things are going to escalate far beyond that. Probably. I mean, uh, you know, my dad's getting himself in trouble at his advanced years um, trying to give people what for on the street. And, um, <laughs> now, here's a, just a little line where he goes and finds someone to sell him some soup. The man in the soup store swiped the counter and listened to the radio, smoking a ceramic cigarette on a chain around his neck. They've got vaping down. They've got vapes. Now, this was written in the partially in the 70s, partially in the 80s, published in 1990. Have you ever seen a reference to vaping that predates that? But, I mean, by this point, everyone did know smoking was really bad for you, but people still like smoking. Yeah, but vapes are really bad for you and people just do them because they like doing them. Yeah. Yeah, but I... People didn't. People were sold that vapes weren't that bad for you I'm not initially. Sure. I, I, I think the, the, this was a pretty futuristic concept. The idea of a ceramic cigarette at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, le- less so now though, because it's, it's so common. <laughs> Although keeping it um, on a chain around your neck, I'm not sure. I think they get still get a bit hot and moist. Hmm. Okay, and then he has a chat with. Um, Dizzy yet. Now, what I there's always a problem with culture books, which is that the culture is utterly omnipotent when it's got its full power on display. Which, from a storytelling point of view, how do you add drama when um, the general contact unit can fly in and fix everything? And what they do in this little bit is try and create some uh, narrative reasons why uh, the big oh, culture yeah. minds can't just fix everything. Uh, and, and put limitations on um, what they're doing. So a little bit of trying to explain that is um, you'll have to use the module. We can't risk bringing the xenophobe in. If you do spring Bay Chai, they'll be on maximum alert. We'd never get in and out without being noticed. And that could swing the whole cluster against us for interfering. I mean, it's a little bit like how in um, the latest uh, Top Gun movie, they had to come up with all these stupid, absolutely ludicrous reasons why they had to use the old planes and, you know, even get up close go down the valley and that sort of thing oh yeah uh it was it was it was completely ludicrous and um uh but it 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 created the um the space for the story they wanted to tell and and we're largely getting equivalent of that now we've got a few things here that we need to get our little heads around so you've got the capsule which is buried in the desert and that's tiny and can basically just fit i think two people um, so the capsule's buried in the desert and primed. The module's hidden, hiding in the nearest gas giant. So that's a small spaceship. Mm-hmm. So they've got to get the, the capsule to pick them up and take that to the module. And then they can make their way to this place, the Impren Habitats, where um, Bay Chai can um, declare these um, siding against the carbon fascists. So that's just setting some yes. scene for some of the terminology and we're going to get. it takes them two days. Do we get, I imagine we're going to get that two-day journey in the next chapter. <laughs> Uh, things are going to get a little bit more complicated than that, but we just need to lay the ground of all these things. And then, well, Smar said, much as I'd like to say, I told you so, and displace you a scout or knife missile, we can't. Their surveillance might just be good enough to spot it. Best we can do is put a microsat in orbit and just passive scan. Watch, in other words. If it sees you in trouble, we'll signal the capsule and the module for you. The alternative is to use the phone, would you believe? There's the unlisted Vanguard numbers you have. Zakawi? Hmm. You do have those numbers? Oh, yeah. Or we have a downlink tap on Solitol's emergency services. Just dial three ones and scream Zakawi at the operator. We'll hear. I'm filled with confidence, he breathed, shaking his head. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, we, we, we very much live on a point today where intelligence services are tapping um, telecommunications networks in this sort of way. Well. I mean, Google's doing it to us all the time. Yeah, sure. But I'm just saying that at the time this was written, this was kind of a wild concept. It, wasn't it easier to tap the analog phone network? <laughs> if you could send a little man to um, go and put some wires in the exchange, yes. But the idea of just penetrating it from um, the next star uh, system okay, over yeah. um, and, uh, and being able to hear everything rather than just what's on a specific line. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, Mullen's back. I know. I meant to mention him in my summary and I forgot. Mm. Um, and he's got a tongue. Does he? 
Like, yeah, he licks his lips and they okay, say. Yeah, it's his Mullen's tongue licked his lips as he concentrated, so they had not literally taken his tongue out after all. And it does ask the question of, um, uh, oh, why didn't they um, just replace, replace his... his vocal cords? You know, what are they up to there? It doesn't actually answer the question, but it just it drops a note that Ian M. Banks has thought about this as well. Well, it seems to be saying that they didn't want them to have a whole range of responsive answers, which we do find out the breadth of his answers we, when he has the fight. Yeah, and we, his we, little... we, we're gonna we're gonna read some yeah. of the answers. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, he could always, you know, write a statement, though, which is the, my kind of objection to this whole thing. They Writing's harder than picking a button. No, but, but it, you know, if he wanted to spill the beans on his masters, he could just type a letter. True. You know, so it, it hasn't actually silenced him in any way. And uh, you'd think, actually, they would have some sort of system to quickly type. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, lots of lots Very of advanced. approaches. I mean, th- these people seem almost advanced enough that they could just be putting some mind body interface on him as well. But um, they clearly just don't want him to be able to speak. Yeah, Elon Musk's Neuralink is is always an option. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now um, we get the uh, the black liquid creeping up the screen, so um, it's a car we can't see it's out of the car. Cool. Always going. Yeah, I thought that was a neat, a neat touch. I like that. Um, and uh, I did love this line of, um, this is just a precaution to ensure Mr. Bajai's privacy is respected. There's nothing like authoritarians worrying about other people's privacy so as not to disclose their secrets. <laughs> um, our governments do that all the time. Um, so they go long, far down to the ground somewhere. Now there's a little bit more giveaway to remind you that he's got the little um, transceiver earring. Um, the transceiver jabbed delicately at his earlobe. He pushed the bead further into his ear. X-ray radiation, the earring whispered. He allowed himself a smile. He waited for them to open the door and demand the transceiver, but the car only moved forward a little again. So they they haven't they they don't know that he's got this little. Do you think they don't know, or they just don't care? They, well, given everything else they're doing, if they'd known it was there, they probably would have removed it. Now, can you remind me? And mm-hmm. perhaps I'm skipping ahead, but what are the what's the what do the glasses do again? Oh, that's just changing his appearance. So when he takes the glasses off, um, everyone who's got pictures of him wearing the glasses, that's no use for identifying him. Right. Because, I mean, the, the woman makes a comment about still wearing the glasses, implying. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's just a little bit of um, spy tradecraft um, of um, making your appearance quickly changeable. Right. It's like wearing a beanie and taking it off, that sort of thing. So anyway, yes, he meets the lady and they've, um, he, he's finally taken into um, the library. Now, this is a bit of um, old school um, library porn. I don't know if you've been to those uh, corners of the internet where they show pictures of the most amazing libraries in the world and you know, it's um, sweeping architecture. Although this is so deep in the ground, they can't have big windows. Um, I did get the AIs to generate me a picture of the library here, but um, it, it all had big windows with uh, sunlight ah. streaming through. And I thought, no, that's not right. Also, I had too many people. And for some reason, all the, the libraries AI generated were just heaving with people. Well, I mean, they are a public space. <laughs> <laughs> Generally. Generally. <laughs> often not many people in them. <laughs> well, I don't know. You go to the National Library during the day, there's lots of people around. Oh, yeah, but it's more a self-help group, isn't it? Um, okay. <laughs> Let's... <laughs> Spent a lot of time in doing my masters in the National Library. Yeah, only because there was no one there. <laughs> Moving on. A thick carpet smothered their footsteps as they went down some steps and onto a large balcony set halfway up the wall of a large hall. Everywhere else the hall was covered with books or tables and they walked down a staircase with books below the wood under their feet, books above the wood over their heads. Um, so, I mean, it, it sounds like it's one of the more glorious libraries in the solar system, but, um, all right. Now we get a really good description of what Zakawi is looking like here, but I'm just going to, um, read in. I tried to get the AI to do this and it just refused. Um, you spent a lot of time doing the AI for this really, I just put a lot of work into this show, Sheridan, and, um, someone just turns up and wrecks everything. Um... <laughs> The fellow was fairly young, long-legged, dark-haired, the hair swept back, held in a ponytail, and possessed a striking, even handsome face, darkened by the sort of beard growth that never disappears through surface shaving alone. The lips were disquieting, looked at exclusively, they appeared cruel and arrogant, and only when the eye took in the rest of the face as well did this impression seem too severe, and reluctantly, perhaps, 
the observer had to allow that the dark glasses could not completely hide wide brows, sorry, wide eyes and full brows, which, open and obvious, made the complete impression not disagreeable. That's very much an academic's observation of a subject. What other shaving is there other than surface shaving? Oh, like laser depilation? And like so waxing? On. Yeah, that sort of thing. But men don't do that. Well, I mean, trans men do. That's the other way around. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's not <laughs> even get into that. Yeah, so, some men do get um, laser treatment of their beards. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I sort of, you know, I've been to a lot of beauty salons. I've never yeah. seen it on the price list. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, because beards came hugely back into the fashion after the millennium. Before that, a lot of guys um, did get permanent treatments to try and reduce their shaving. Oh, yeah, during the metrosexual phase. Do you remember uh, that in the 2000s? Just even the- into the 80s, the whole, but just before beards became fashionable again at... Um, because they were so desperately unfashionable for such a long period of time. But, they were, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fashion, what has it ever done for us? Um, okay, so we, we've got Bay Chai realising that he's talking to his um, long ago comrade in arms. And it's well, yeah, he's starting to work it out, yeah. And then we get the thing about being straight back. Bay Chai drew himself up. He'd noticed that he was stooping more these days, but he was still vain enough to want to greet people straight backed. So there's definitely a deliberate resonance there, and I suspect the the sole reason for the the walkies at the start of the chapter was um, to throw that in there. Maybe it's just the bit at the beginning of the chapter is trying to align these two characters as being very different but very similar. Because it says, you know, Beisha was old-fashioned enough to wear his age, Mm. but, like, there's still something inherently similar about their own sort of vanity uh, all, I think all people have a level of vanity. All men certainly have a particular type of vanity. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think he's definitely alluding to that. Also just reminding us that um, Zakawe is actually old. Yeah. He, but he looks young, and which is quite important to how this bit of the chapter goes down. There's a nice little line about libraries here. He looked around the library, so many old books they smelled, so many words set down, so many lives spent scribbling, so many eyes dimmed by reading. He wondered what that people bothered as much as they did. Now, that's definitely a Zakawe thought, not an Ian M. Banks thought. There is actually a funny thing in this chapter where they change the point of view of the narration. Okay, from who to who? Well, because when Beche comes in and looks at Zakawe, the uh, view from is his from point his, view. his point of view. Yeah. And then at other times it's Zakawe's. Or mm. well, then just the, you know. The narrator. The omnipotent mm-hmm. re- narrator is omnipotent uh, omniscient omniscient um, now I've got a question sure um, so remind me did is it Beche who has bought Sakawe there or is it Beche's minders because he doesn't seem to know the meeting is happening no yeah Beche's minders agreed that Sakawe could go and meet Beche but, yeah, so, and then, because then he makes the decision to go to the surface, Beche yes. does. Yeah. Do you think he recognises that he's in some sort of danger? He definitely thinks Sakawa is here for a reason and um, you know, there's, Sakawa's, like, make, making little gestures at tapping his ear that people are listening. So, um, and given that it's hinted that basically he and Sakawa fought a war in the past, um, the, the Zakawe turning up would be telling him that there's something big as a foot. Yeah. Um, but as we'll, you know, discuss when we get to it, Beche isn't quite expecting things to get quite as kinetic as they do in this mm. chapter. Um, in fact, he's absolutely horrified by it. Um, I do love the um, the minder saying, oh, well, Mr. Beche, it might be awkward to go to the service. And he's like, well, why have the elevators stopped working? <laughs> It's almost Malcolm Turnbull-esque in that turn of phrase there. (laughs) (laughs) Now, let's discuss this bit of relationship. A young young blonde woman walked out of the stacks, arms loaded with books. She blinked hard when she saw him, then came over behind Bei Chai, who looked up and smiled at her. Ah, my dear, this is Mr. Staberind, my assistant, Ms. Ubriel Sheol. Delighted, he nodded. Shit, he thought. Uh, which I, I just love those two little tiny chapters there. Um, delighted, he nodded. Shit, he thought. Um, 
And um, what do you think he's? Oh, he's worried she's going to get in the way. Yeah, and then uh, Michelle put the books down on the table and put her hand on Baychai's shoulder. The old man put his own thin fingers on top of hers. I think we're meant to be reading quite a lot into those fingers. Well, they're definitely right, being told there's a very close relationship. Of... In- intimate, some might yes, say. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's, you know, obviously there to keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't um, wander off. Well, her motivation's a little unclear. Yeah, but she's armed. Is she armed or is it the other woman that's armed? I thought they both had guns. Yeah, okay. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but, uh, yes. And Beche saying, uh, wonderful girl, don't know what I'd do without her. And <laughs> Zakawa's thinking to himself, you may have to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so then they get to the surface and, um, Beche is suddenly saying, oh, I, I, is there a fair? I want to go to a fair. I always enjoyed the noise and bustle. And I mean, that's obviously a cover. The guy's been living down underground in a um, in an archive for years. If he loved fairs that much, then, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that wouldn't have been for him. Interesting that Zakawa is obviously thinking from there to how to shake the tails and uh, and things like that. But saying, oh, let's, let's go to the flower market first and then we can just get the ferry. So he knows that the... Ferry from the flower market will only take one vehicle so that the um, the half track full of goons that are following them, um, they can um, shake off. Yeah. Uh, and another half track. There have been quite a few half tracks at different times in this uh, book for a pretty unusual mode of transport. That is something I would not have paid much attention to. <laughs> so very nice of um, Zakawi to buy flowers for both the women he's about to um, whack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you think it's his way of preemptive apology? Is this <laughs> that what's going on? <laughs> um, and I did like this line. Uh, Beche chatted, remembering fears from his youth for Ubrel Sheol. Uh, <laughs> the poor, long-suffering Ubrel Sheol. Listen to all these stories, yeah. <laughs> the fears of his youth, you know, she's she's got to let him touch her and um, smile at his stories. It's um, She really... She really works for the uh, the governance, doesn't she? And, you know, then Zakawi goes kinetic once he's um, lost the half-track on the other side of the river. What, do you have any particular takeaways from the um, the action scenes, the big fight? Well, Molan's, um, oh, Molan's um, pre-programmed phrasing is quite interesting. It, yeah, we'll get to the, I mean, it, it's... So just quickly before we get that, it is Sheol who's got the gun? Because the line here is, My pleasure, he said, then leant across Sheol to tap Beichai on the arm to attract his attention to a piece of fairground equipment wheeling into the sky. Um, he reached across Sheol again, pulled down a zip before she realised what was happening and extracted the gun he'd already felt there. He looked at it and started to laugh as though the whole thing was a silly mistake, then turned and fired at the glass screen behind Mullen's oh, head. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, which, because we were just watching... Um, Roadhouse, the new one, um, last night. And it, it was funny in a lot of the action scenes. Um, it's Jack Gyllenhaal, isn't it? Yes. Um, he makes a big thing about distracting people with the obvious before he belts them really hard. Yes. Um, which I thought of when I reread that this morning. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, really dumb movie, by the way. Dumb, dumb, dumb movie. But, you know, fun if you've got this pretty dumb. Watch. Um, I just didn't think they could make movies that dumb anymore. Well, I think the original one was kind of dumb. Yeah, but they didn't have to remake the dumb bits. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So, um, Mullen's been um, slumped over. Um, Zakawi starts whacking the women. Were you comfortable with the, the the belting of the women? I mean, they seem to have it coming to me. I'm all right with it when it's, you know. Justified by the plot. It's not just because they're women. Um, yeah. He doesn't seem to be doing because he's angry. It's just kind of necessary. Just, yeah, he needs to get rid of them. And they have brought guns to this fight. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, and then he throws his glasses onto the um, the floor of the car. Um, Sheil's screaming. Um, Zakawi's saying, what are you doing? And he's saying, she's got a gun, Soldier. And the poor old Soldier's like, but you know what? <laughs> you imagine you've been living with someone for years and years and years in an intimate relationship, and then suddenly it turns out that they're um, there to kill you. That... Um, mm. Uh, it'd take a while to adjust your um, your mindset, mm. particularly in 
you know, these sorts of events. And yeah, and then the flight, the fight being constantly um, punctuated by Mullen's voice box uh, with inappropriate comments, um, <laughs> you know, is, is tremendous fun. Um, quite a good fight. Um, I was a bit thrown when Mullen said, I'm here to help you. I was like, oh, is he like <laughs> trying to help Sakawe? I'm mm-hmm. very confused. Then the line, Mullen rolled slowly into the gutter and lay still. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? My name is Mullen. Can I help you? You're not allowed in here. This is private property. Where do you think you're going? Stop or I shoot. Money is no object. We have powerful friends. Could you direct me to the nearest telephone? I'll fuck you harder, all right, bitch. Feel this. I I love that as a piece of humor in the middle. It's like a whole bunch of phrases like a rich person will program their robot to have. Yeah. (laughs) Not so sure about the last one. I think that was a Mullen special. I'll fuck you harder, all right. Yeah. But doesn't that mean that he's being forced to have sex? No, that's just some of Mullen's pre-programmed for his own visits to the women of his life. I sort of took it that he was involved in some sort of weird sort of sex orgy controlled by his master where he had to fuck someone. Well, that woman we met earlier from the governance who he massaged probably, um, anyway, let's not delve too deeply into the... Yeah. Uh, whatever Ian M. Banks was trying to say on that, um, it's probably unfair to the ghost of Banks to um, suggest that was necessarily what was going on there. I just thought it was more the women of Mullen's life rather than the, oh, the crazy rich people. No, I took it the crazy rich people. Okay. If you're a crazy rich person, you're going to program your robot man to have sex with you, right? Like. Okay. Well, okay. This is. This, I mean, if I had a robot is, man, that's what I would do. This is, this is an insight into the woman's mind that I didn't previously possess. So well, maybe just mine. That's well, a woman's mind, anyway. Then we get the first of the shootings. There was a noise behind the buildings, shielding the river and the flower market. A bang and a whoosh. They both looked to the sky. The enlarging speck that was the capsule blossomed with light on a stalk that led back behind the buildings towards the flower market. So that's someone on the ground shooting at the capsule. Mm-hmm. The capsule sailed through the resulting incandescent bloom, seemed to shake itself, then a lance of light darted from it down the same line as though in reply. So it's the capsule blasting the hell out of some poor buggers on the ground. So right. at, at this point, um, Zakawe's uh, mission to lay low and not um, yeah, draw attention um, is, is not going well. And um, then, um, you know, Zakawe's saying, we've got no time, we've got to move. Um, and, of course, the capsule lands, its hatches open, and he takes out of it a very large gun. Remember we met the plasma rifle in um, on the, the Culture um, GSV? Oh, yep. You know, when he spent um, hours playing around in the bay and couldn't uh, make it work. Yeah, the, I yeah. forgot about that. So he finally gets to uh, pull out his um, beloved um, piece of art, um, ancient plasma rifle. Um, Sakawe Beche said, voice suddenly controlled, Are you insane? A tearing, screaming noise came above the city from up canyon. They both looked up at a slim shape streaking towards them, bellying down through the air. He spat into the gutter. He raised the plasma rifle, sighted at the fast approaching dot, and fired. A bolt of light leapt from the gun to sky. The aircraft burst smoke and veered away on a helix of debris crashing somewhere down canyon. In a scream that became thunder, echoes rolled back from all over the city. He looked at the old man. What was the question again? <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's how the this chap this chapter ends. Um, so we finally get the, to see the plasma rifle in action. It seems to work very well. It um, blasts that um, that plane out of the sky. It did a good job. Did a, did a good job. Zakawe, you know, had to had to do the right things to use it. So that all that all worked. Um, time well spent in um, the, the GSV, in fact. True. Okay, so Sharon, we're, we're at the end of the chapter. Um, what are your takes on it? Well, I want to... I'm, I'm keen to know if they escape. What do you want to bet on that? Probably, I mean, I'm going to probably bet Sakawa escapes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Baicho? I'm going to say yes. Okay, cool. I feel like there's been a lot of build-up for the character just to put him <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> be kind of cool if a piece of shrapnel just clipped him yeah. and his um, jugular bled True. out or something. But um, okay, who's your favourite character? I'm gonna this? go Molan. Yeah, Molan gets another. Oh, did he have? An, did I have? I thought one? you had him as a favourite character before, but I could be wrong. Oh, maybe it's Beche then. Mm. 
I thought he was going to be a bit more evil. Beche would be evil. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. I just had a sinister vibe. Weird. Okay. All right. I mean, he could still be evil. True. I don't, I don't want to spoil things for you. True. Um, and you can have your head cannon. You could really do a head cannon of Beche actually being evil. But, um, hmm. Okay. That's something for the fans. They're not going to like that at all. Well, um, it's just more that. You know, he had to go to such great lengths to, like, attract his attention and stuff. But he hadn't even attracted his attention. They, they cover that, that, you know, he's like, oh, did, yeah. did you see me in the news? Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't really follow the news. So, really, he wasn't evil. He's just a hermit. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's very hard to tell the difference, really. <laughs> it's more just crimes of opportunity. Uh, okay, no ship names. You, you're reasonably across the difference between the capsule and the module and, um, and what's moving around and, and where things are going. For the next, so you are, it is going to appear. Because I, I was wondering if we'd just skip forward in the next chapter to when they're arrived at the destination, hmm. which, you know, does tend to happen at times with the... At, at times. Uh, you you seem to be implying that this is important for me to remember. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I don't mean to spoil that, but um, yes, yeah, stuff's, stuff's going to happen. More stuff's going to happen. And of course, the next chapter is um, a backwards in time one. So they're um, about to get in the capsule. Yes. And they're going to the module. That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. I'm good with that. I okay. get it. All right. Nice one. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to um, highlight? Um, no? We're all good? No, I'm good. All right. Well, thank you very much, folks. We will try and be back in your ears in, I don't know, a week or so. Um, it's a pretty short, simple chapter next one. So. Cool. Yeah. All right. See you later, folks. Bye. Bye.